Welcome to the Beeson Podcast. I'm your host, Doug Sweeney, and I'm joined today by this fall's commencement speaker, the Reverend Dr. Gerald Heastan, the senior pastor of the Calvary Memorial Church in Oak Park, Illinois, and the co-founder and chairman of the board of the Center for Pastor Theologians. Welcome, Dr. Heastan, to the program. Thank you. Great to be here. Great to have you, my friend. Uh, let's introduce you to our Beeson audience. Tell us just a little bit about yourself, your childhood, how you came to know the Lord. Yeah, so I grew up in a Christian home, um, uh, kind of Bible church tradition uh, in the Chicago area. My uh, grandfather was the pastor of the church that I grew up in, mm -hmm. and um, my dad was also a pastor for a bit, and uh, then went into missions work and executive work. And um, so I've, I've kind of grew up in the church, and and uh, from the earliest memories, I've always had a sense of. Uh, the gospel, uh, probably when I was 12 or so, it was at a passion player church put on that I just had this um, just spirit uh, given kind of eye opening awareness of the beauty and glory of Christ uh, in that passion play. And I can distinctly remember going home that night and 12 year old laying in bed, tears coming down my, mm -hmm. my eyes, uh, just begging the Lord to let me into heaven. And felt like he told me he'd let me in. <laughs> and, uh, so that was, uh, that really, really probably the start of kind of an earnest uh, faith uh, journey. And then went on to uh, Moody Bible Institute and uh, did some time in pastoral ministry as a youth pastor for a little bit. Then on to uh, graduate school at TEDS where we met and yes, we uh, did a, a master's there. And then eventually did a PhD in classics and uh, am now pastoring uh, senior pastor at a church in Oak Park, which is just right next to Chicago. We butt up against the Chicago border. So. Yeah. Well, because some of the people who listen to these podcast episodes are people thinking about seminary, wondering whether seminary is for them, and trying to discern what it means to say, let's follow God's leading in our lives. Let's see if God has called us to or is helping us to become uh, pastors ourselves, I want to ask you about that. So you're the grandson and the son of pastors. Mm -hmm. You had a real conversion experience, but did you grow up thinking you got to take over the family business? I mean, how did you how did you process as a teenage yeah. Christian what you're supposed to do when you grew up? Uh, it's 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 uh, it's not an illustrious story. I mean, here it is in brief. When I was in fourth grade, we had our missions week, and all the missionaries would come back and they would like. You know, they'd come to the Sunday school classes and they would tell stories about their missions work. And I remember being in fourth grade and uh, sitting in the, the primary room and we had a missionary come and she said, she was from Papua New Guinea. And she said, when I was in fourth grade, because it was an older church, she, when I was in fourth grade, I was sitting in the exact chairs that you're sitting in right now. And the missionary lady came and she was talking about missions work. And that's when I knew in fourth grade that I was going to be a missionary. And I thought at the time, I thought, oh no, dear God, I'm going to have to be a missionary in Papua New Guinea. I was, I was, I was actually, it, it was like the the hound of heaven was after me. I was very, I was very scared about that, you know, because I, you know, believed in God and I thought He was going to come get me and make me go over to Papua New Guinea or something. So I had this like missions monkey like hanging on my back, you know, for you know all my elementary years and middle school. And then my youth pastor, freshman year of high school, he said to me. Hey, I think you would be a good youth pastor. And I thought that was that's it. That's my lifeline. I'm going to be a All youth right. pastor in the states. That's that'll how I, how I'll satisfy this uh, calling from God. And you're still a young boy. At yeah, this I was a freshman in high school okay. at the time. But um, so it's kind of funny. But that actually is probably there's some truth in that, right? But I remember thinking, um, even from my freshman year of high school, that I was going to head towards Moody Bible Institute, uh, which is where I was, you know, grew up in that area study to be a pastor and be a pastor. So I had already made that determination uh, by freshman year of high school. Wow. Yeah. All right. So you enter Moody. Did you major in, what do they call it, their pastoral studies or? Yeah, I think um, I, I think I did uh, biblical theology is what okay. I did. And um, I, my father, as I said, my grandfather was a pastor. My father was a pastor. My best friend's dad then kind of in between that was uh, the pastor of our church too. And I was very close with our youth pastor. So I kind of felt like I was not I was not unfamiliar with pastoral ministry. That didn't seem like foreign territory to me. I, I mm -hmm. kind of 
that that seemed familiar. What I really wanted was kind of the Bible knowledge and the kind of the scriptural competency to be able to exercise some of the pastoral uh, experiences that I had seen already lived out uh, in my family life and friends' lives. Wow. All right. So tell us just a little bit about your early history in ministry. I mean, how did you go from feeling like that's what God had for you yeah. to actually practicing pastoral ministry? Well, the first, uh, so we, I graduated and my wife uh, went to Trinity, uh, which was kind of across town. We grew up going to church together, so we knew each other. And uh, we got married 10 months out of me being done with Moody. So um, <clears throat> so we uh, got married and then 10 months later, I get my timeline maybe I'm mixed up there. We got married and then it was 10 months later we went into ministry. Is I think that's what the 10 months thing is. So my first job was a youth pastor at a church in Nebraska. It was an evangelical free church. And um, we we didn't want to get too far away from Chicago. And so we, we kind of figured a day's drive was about as far away we, as we were going to get uh, right. from my wife's family. Both families family. were there. Yeah, both families in Chicago. And so uh, Fremont, Nebraska was like the outer edge of the, uh, of the, of the circle. And um, they were looking, it was for, through the Moody referral listings for graduates who were looking for positions. And uh, they were looking for somebody. And, um, and uh, so we ended up going out to Nebraska and where I was a youth pastor and then also did kind of Christian education uh, there for that church. It was a smaller church. Uh, it's all relative, I suppose. But Fremont is a town of maybe 25,000 surrounded by farms. So mm. it's, it's a farming community. And uh, that was a very good experience for me pastorally. I had a, I was the second full-time pastor at the church. Uh, so, um, so it was me and one other pastor. I got a lot of experience, got to get my feet wet in a lot of different things. And, uh, and that's, a, I mean, there maybe there's a, a word of uh, wisdom there for folks. I mean, there's something about going into a, into a church that has room for you to sort of be able to move in a lot of different spaces. I also pastored for a while uh, as an associate pastor at a mega church, but it was very much more, you had your lane and that's the only thing you did, you know, so you didn't get as much kind of a broad experience. So the, the small, the smaller church was a very good experience. And that, um, that was very good. I think my wife and I would say we were still, we were 10 months married at the time. And so we had to figure out being married too. And that, uh, was more of a challenge, frankly, than the pastoral ministry was. So, uh, I think the Lord was very kind and gracious to us in helping us get over some rough stuff, uh, early on uh, in our marriage. And then, uh, we were there, uh, for about three and a half years. And then that's when I came back to Chicago area and did uh, a couple of years at Trinity, um, yeah. doing some master's work. All right, let's fast forward. The thing that most people who know about you know about you is that you're the senior pastor of Calvary Memorial Church in Oak Park. Can you tell us just a little bit about your church and what the Lord's doing yeah. there these days? Yeah, so Calvary Calvary is a great church. And and it's also, I think, it's unique in the sense that it's it's in a unique space. So Oak Park, if you live in so if you live in the city of Chicago, Oak Park is a suburban church because you are coming out of this. We have a lot of young families that are moving out of the city. They want to get into a suburban church, and so they come to Oak Park. But if you live further west in the the suburbs of Chicago, Oak Park is a city church because it's just right next to Chicago. It's got alley parking. It just has a feel more of like a city church. So we're kind of right at the headwaters of like urban and suburban. We're right where those two waters kind of mix. And um, that creates just some interesting dynamics and feel. Uh, we're, we're, that probably captures a lot of the fusion elements of Calvary. Calvary is an evangelical church, um, but, but Oak Park is, uh, it's a beautiful town. It's a great town. Uh, I live in the town. It's wonderful. It's very progressive. I would say it's uh, aggressively progressive. And so an evangelical church in Oak Park is a little bit of a sore thumb, uh, frankly. And so that's another kind of fusion point of you've kind of got the, the conservative and progressive elements uh, coming together. Um, and I would say probably in my church, half of my congregation votes Democrat, half votes Republican. Uh, we have a lot of socioeconomic diversity. We have a lot of uh, ethnic diversity. We're probably 
you know, I don't know, 60 to 65 percent white, and then it's a mix uh, beyond that, um, predominantly African American, but also we have an increasingly larger Hispanic population uh, members. So it, there's just it's a, an interesting um, conglomeration of a lot of things that that tend to get bifurcated in broader culture, and also that tend to get bifurcated even in evangelical culture. So, um, so I love it because it, uh, I'm an Enneagram 9 for anyone that cares about the Enneagram. And part of my gift set is kind of bringing things together and like uh, kind of making peace and diplomacy between things that would otherwise potentially be in conflict. And so I feel like there's a lot of opportunity for me to kind of hold together tensions and bring things together. And uh, I would, what I love about our church is we have particularly over the last 10 years, but maybe five years, like we really have coalesced around a shared love of Christ and a celebration of his love for us. And that trumps then all of our political leanings or our social leanings or the different things that could potentially pull us apart, get united and held together uh, in Christ. Yeah. Well, that reminds me of your sermon this morning yeah. at commencement. By the time this podcast interview drops, your sermon will be edited and posted on our YouTube page, and there will be a link on the website, so on. So the people listening now can go hear the sermon. So we don't need the whole sermon here, yeah. but give us a little teaser. What did you talk about this morning with the students who are graduating? Yeah, the, the, the basic gist is uh, the question I posed at the front end is what is it that someone heading out into pastoral ministry or any kind of um, ministry, gospel ministry, what is the sort of the key thing that that person needs to always keep in mind and know? And we walked through uh, some different options, you know, is it the scriptures? Uh, and uh, yes, but um, the scriptures can be uh, wielded in damaging ways if it doesn't have a heart of love behind it. So maybe love is the key, but um, Jesus says loving God is more important than loving others and kind of working all the way back down to what I think the foundation is, is God's love for us in Christ is the, the bedrock, uh, uh, foundation upon which the gospel minister has to build his or her ministry. And, um, you know, thinking of Paul's prayer in Ephesians three, that we are rooted and grounded in God's love for us in Christ. And if we try to build a, a, a found, if we try to build a ministry that's rooted and grounded in our love for God or our love for others or even the scriptures, we're not down far enough into what are the roots of the foundation, which is God's love for us. Yeah, well, that's a wonderful truth. And I think probably one of the things that was in the sermon that the Lord used to make it so effective in so many of our lives, at least thus far, it's only been a few hours, but it seemed like the Lord was really at work as you were preaching, was the story you told of the time in your life where you just, you weren't sensing mm. God's love in your own life. And you kind of looked at the students as somebody who's been doing pastoral ministry for 20 years. And it's as though you were just being honest with them and yeah. saying, look, this is important and it's not automatic. And I mean, God's love is unconditional, Yeah, but we need to let God's love in. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And even, you know, John chapter three or uh, Revelation chapter three, where the Lord stands at the door and knocks, right? Like, what is he, I think, what are, why don't we open the door? Like, what are we afraid he's going to do if he comes in? And I, I think we say we want to let Christ in, but the truth is it's just, it's vulnerable and messy. And if he comes in, who knows what he's going to do? And it's just safer to keep him on the outside and work for him than it is to like, let him in on the inside. And, um, I think that's what I had found. Uh, I had fallen into that over, a, a long season of, of ministry where I was working for Christ, doing things for Christ, teaching for Christ. Uh, and, and at the same time, like praying, like, Lord, show yourself to me. But it was, you know, inviting Jesus in with the left hand and holding him out with the right hand too. Mm -hmm. And I, I think like, I didn't even quite know how to stop doing that. And uh, I think that sabbatical experience, which I talk about, in this, in this sermon, but that sabbatical experience sort of forced me to come to terms with that sort of divided, mm. you know, heart or impulse, um, which I wasn't fully conscious of. It wasn't a conscious thing, but... Yeah. Um, As a perfect yeah. seminary student, I mean, for, yeah. for reasons that are good, yeah, we're busy for the Lord. That's right. Every day, 
all the time. And if we're not careful, as you were suggesting during the uh, commencement ceremony, we can let our busyness for the Lord be the thing that we think is going to sustain us, yeah. you know, in ministry. And it, it's not. That's right. And I think like what, where I maybe had gone before is like, I would have said, okay, yeah, I, I can't let my busyness for the Lord trump my relationship with the Lord. So I need to, I need to always remember to love Christ first, but that still was me loving Christ. Like that was, I had taken it back down to that point. But if you're not letting Christ love you, you would actually don't have something to love Christ in return with, right? Yeah. And so it, it's not just kind of uh, getting rid of the distractions and the busyness of life so you can focus on loving Christ better. You have to like get rid of the busyness and the distractions. And even you have to set aside your attempts to love Christ and just focus on how he is loving you. And that provides then the wellspring of love that you can love him back with and love others with and then do ministry with. So when I came back from my sabbatical, the, the first passage that I preached from was in Nehemiah chapter eight, where the joy of the Lord is your strength, right? And I think I had spent so much of my pastoral ministry, I think I would have said that the conviction of the Lord is your strength, like, uh, like firm convictions. We have to have firm convictions. And mm -hmm. that's what kind of gives us the energy we need to press through the hard times. But, um, yeah, I just think like looking like as a parent, uh, looking, I think even some into my congregation, like, I don't know that like the firmness of my convictions is what my congregation and my kids and my friend like really need from me. Like yeah. they need, not that they don't, we need convictions, but convictions come from joy. Mm -hmm. And if you get convictions without joy, you know, that, that's actually life sucking. It's not life giving. Yeah. You know? I want our listeners to learn about and pray for and support the Center for Pastor Theologians. I said at the top of the show when I was introducing you that you're the co-founder and chairman of the board of the Center for Pastor Theologians. Of course, the Center for Pastor Theologians has been active and at work at Beeson Divinity School for a little while now. But I bet not all of our listeners know as much as they should about what we call the CPT. And we've got the founder here. Tell us a little bit about the Center for Pastor Theologians and why you're so excited about it. So the Center for Pastor Theologians, uh, in, in the, the kind of the seminal ideas for it, uh, we really have you to blame, Doug, uh, because it was in Doug's, uh, it was in your Jonathan Edwards class. I remember having this insight uh, when you were explaining that in Edwards' day in New England, uh, the the majority of the New England theologians, far and away, they were clergy. And right? so uh, if you wanted to grow up and be a theologian, you had to grow up and be a pastor because no one else was going to pay you to be a theologian except the churches were going to pay you to be a theologian. And so the vast majority of the texts that were in like the Yale Library or the College of New Jersey Library, these texts were written by pastors, New England clergy. And uh, I had come to TED's uh, out of pastoral ministry, and I was feeling the disconnect of, I came to TEDS to study theology out of pastoral ministry, but the theology that I was reading sometimes felt disconnected from the pastoral ministry that I had been doing and then wanted to go back and to do some more of. Mm. And it struck me that that uh, shift in social location where the theologians used to be pastors, but now the theologians are professors. And so if the social location is sort of animating and driving and provoking the questions that theologians are asking, well, the ecclesial context is going to provoke one set of questions, and the academic context is going to provoke another set of questions. And there's some overlap between those two, but those are not exactly the same. And it struck me that uh, whereas in New England, to be a theologian was to be a pastor, you fast forward, you know, 300 years, and to be a theologian is to be a professor. It's completely shifted. And so I began to think about what would it look like to try to help pastors reclaim their sense of identity as theologians. Not just not just for their local church, but certainly for that, but also for the broader church community, right? So that the church, rather than sort of passively, and the pastoral community, rather than sort of passively standing with its hands out, 
theologically speaking, and asking the academy to fill them with theological riches, the pastoral community would begin to take responsibility for itself of mining and thinking about the scriptures and the great tradition and answering the questions that the church uh, is faced with today uh, from a pastoral perspective and like with pastoral wisdom. Um, so it, the CPT is looking to fuse together the life of the mind and the, the great sort of intellectual theological uh, resources of the Christian tradition with pastoral ministry and bringing those two things together for the benefit of local congregations, but also for the benefit of just the broader church. So what does that look like in practice? You're, you are somebody who's obviously very smart and learned and you have a doctorate and so on, but you're a pastor. You, you pastor a church every week of your life. You don't operate mostly as a professor or maybe, yeah. you, I mean, tell us if you're going to kind of live this out. I mean, we're, it's, it's an early stage in the movement. Of course, this is uh, something yeah. that's in development. But how do you put this into practice in the church? So, I mean, how it, so I was the executive pastor of the church where I'm serving now for eight years. And then I've been the senior pastor now for another four. So I've, I've been kind of doing this in both like associate role and then also senior pastor role. And I think those are a little bit different. Um, and uh, when I was the associate, I had a bit more mental space, maybe, because I wasn't preaching every week. So your you're, you're kind of, uh, your, your theological musings are maybe more focused on whatever it is, the, the writing project that I, so I, did, I actually did my PhD um, during that associate pastor space. I, that'd be very hard for me to pull it off now as a senior pastor. Mm -hmm. I don't think I can easily do that um, because as a senior pastor, I'm preaching every week or not. It's not every week. It's I'm kind of three on one off is sort of the rotation that we have worked out. And my preaching ministry occupies a lot of my mental space now. But uh, I also uh, am very intentional about how I use my time. And I'm so I'm currently writing a book right now on the doctrine of justification for Baker Academic. It's part of a soteriology series. I'm about halfway through it, and uh, it's it's not a popular level book. So this isn't written to kind of, like this isn't like uh, repackaging my sermon series, you know, and then just kind of broadcasting it. Uh, this is a, it's kind of a standalone volume. A lot of what I'm researching and writing for this book is finding its way into my sermons, but um, but it's kind of tangential, you know, and, uh, and I'm probably doing about two chapters a year uh, making progress on this book. So it's not I'm not writing it with lightning speed, um, but I'm making steady progress uh, on it. And along the way, I've also uh, written a number of chapters for this volume or chapter for that volume and mostly in and around uh, patristics and uh, early Christianity, which is where my uh, doctoral work has been. So, you know, I don't want to give some romanticized vision that uh, it's like super easy to do, but I also want to just say that this is not impossible, right? And I think if the Lord, I think the Lord is calling every pastor to be a theologian for their own local congregation. That's just a given. I think that's part of the job description. So if you don't think of yourself as a theologian, you need to think about your calling because that is the calling is to be a theologian for your congregation. But not every pastor is called to write books for Baker Academic or even to go on and get a PhD. Uh, but some are, and I think it is possible, and it should not be uh, seen as an impossible task. I think that's something that pastors should consider. I think what I want with the CPT is you have these young people like me when I was in grad school, and, and you come to that fork in the road where you're like, oh, I, I like theology and I like scholarship, and I could see myself writing theological scholarship, but I also like people in pastoral ministry and I can see myself pastoring and I just don't know which to choose. I'm going to have to pick one or the other. Mm. And I want to say, no, no, you, those can be held together. Um, those can be held together. Uh, you can do the theological scholarship and the writing uh, and pastoral ministry and loving and caring for mm. people. And that that is in fact the native home of theology. Like that's what it's for. It's for the care of souls. Yeah, I agree. And what difference do you want this emphasis to make in the lives of the people in your church? Clearly, you listen to what you just said. It's going to make a difference in the way a pastor thinks yeah. of what he's doing day by day. Yeah. But what difference do you want it to make for the people? 
So I would say that my congregants, most of them probably don't even know that I'm writing the book on the doctrine of justification. So this is the work that I do as a pastor theologian with a PhD who's trying to provide leadership to other pastors and theologians. That's largely um, above and beyond what my congregants are interested in, right? And I don't try to make them interested in it. Um, I, I, this, the way I think about it a little bit is like if you, you think about um, uh, a physician, like a family doctor, the family doctor has to read all the academic medical journals to make sure he understands or she understands how best to care for the patients that come in. But when the patients come in, the family doctor does not need to like sit down and explain to them all of the academic medical journals. That's more than what the patient needs. The patient just needs to know how to live a healthy life and to take care of whatever ailment is like affecting them. So I think that's what every pastor needs to be, is like the family doctor who is availing themselves of the theological uh, uh, teachings and scriptural expertise that's enabling them to care for their their congregation, but their congregation doesn't need to know everything that they know. But then I think there, what I'm trying to inhabit is sort of a middle space where, a, where there's a research doctor that doesn't just write the academic journals, but also doesn't just see patients sitting kind of in that middle space where they see patients and they are reading and contributing academic journals um, or scholarly journals. And they're trying to like bridge the gap between these two worlds. And uh, so that's a bit of how I see my work. And I don't, so again, much of my writing is, in fact, I'm going to say that probably most of my writing is not written to my congregants. Now, I write it in ways that are non-specialist. And so there are a fair number of my congregants that are very motivated, and they like reading what I write. Um, but my audience is usually like pastors. I'm trying to influence pastor theologians and other uh, scholars and thinkers that care about the church and are interested in the life and health of the church. So I don't know if I answered that question or no, not. No, you but, did. Okay. You did. And you're doing that ministry very, very well. I, I can testify as somebody who, who knows you well. Yeah. All right, Jared, we always like to end these uh, interviews on the Beeson podcast by way of um, kind of personal edification in the lives of those who will listen to us. And we do so by asking our guests, so what's going on in your life these days that the Lord's at work in? What's the Lord teaching you these days? What's the Lord doing in your life these days that we might conclude with as a way of uh, building up those who are listening? Well, I would connect that back into what I was sharing earlier. I still feel like I am um, uh, learning how to live into what I feel like the Lord taught me during my sabbatical experience about being open and staying open to the Lord's love for me. And uh, we're, we're preaching through 2 Corinthians, have been now for the better part of a year and a half. And in 2 Corinthians 7, the Apostle Paul, he's appealing to the Corinthians and he says, uh, we've opened wide our hearts to you. Open wide your hearts back to us. And he, he's asking for open-heartedness. And he's asking for open-heartedness by giving open-heartedness. And so he's opening up his heart without a guarantee that they're going to open up their hearts back to him or that they're not going to just like abuse his heart, that he's just kind of exposed and laid bare. And what there's such a powerful um, ministry that, that Paul has with the Corinthians, but beneath that, the reason Paul can open up his heart to the Corinthians is because he's opened up his heart to Christ who has filled his heart with Christ's love. And so I was just thinking uh, just, you know, a couple weeks ago about a challenging week that I had in front of me and I could kind of feel some of the, you know, the stressors, you know, lining up on the runway, getting ready to, you know, to kind of come in and land on my head. And I was praying about it. I just felt like the Lord just was saying to me, like, stay open hearted, stay open hearted, because I, I think what I can do when I feel the stress stacking up is I just start kind of tortoise shelling up. You know, I don't get mean. I don't get necessarily angry. But I just, I just kind of retreat back into myself, and and uh, but then when you do that, you lose the capacity to love, and you're also not just shutting out the stressors, but you're shutting out Christ too. And I think that's the thing that I'm really trying to stay cognizant of, and just staying open to God's love for me, so that I can continue to love other people in the way that He's called me to. Wonderful way to conclude. 
You have been listening to the Reverend Dr. Gerald Heastend. He is a dear friend and has been for many years. He serves as the senior pastor of Calvary Memorial Church in Oak Park, Illinois. He's also the co-founder and chairman of the board of the Center for Pastor Theologians. He preached a wonderful sermon in today's commencement service. Please check it out at the Beeson YouTube page and be edified by it yourself. Listeners, we love you. We thank you for tuning in. Please pray for the students of Beeson Divinity School and uh, for the pastors involved in the Center for Pastor Theologians. We say goodbye for now. You've been listening to the Beeson Podcast, coming to you from the campus of Samford University. Our theme music is by Advent Birmingham. Our announcer is Mike Pascarello. Our engineer is Rob Willis, and our show host is Doug Sweeney. For more episodes and to subscribe, visit Beeson Divinity dot com slash podcast you can also find the Beeson podcast on iTunes and Spotify 